Well, uh, Dean Kumar, thank you very much for that overly generous introduction. Uh, my father would have proud and uh, my mother would have believed it. <laughs> um, so what I want to talk a little bit about is um, what, what some of the things that my colleagues and I uh, were able to get done. Um, and my not so hidden agenda is, is uh, to persuade you that, uh, that you should can think about public service uh, during uh, some point of your career because prior to the, uh, as opposed to the, uh, I think, view that uh, people have about government is that, uh, like, nothing happens, uh, that it is actually uh, possible to, to get things, some things done. Um, and I wanted to start off by um, answering what, a question that some people have, which is, like, how do you get one of these jobs? So how are you in a position where you get to uh, advise uh, the President of the United States. Uh, that's me hanging out with uh, John Holdren, uh, who is the, the President's science advisor. Um, and this is uh, the reason is that <clears throat> I had played a similar role working for uh, President Clinton uh, from 1993 to 2001. Uh, so uh, when after Obama won, uh, they reached out to me and asked me if I would le lead the transition team for the Office of, of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, and the reason that I got that job is that <clears throat> I'd started volunteering uh, in the 1988 um, presidential campaign. And so even though uh, the Democrats didn't win that time, I got to know a lot of people who uh, wound up working for, uh, for President Clinton. So it is a good example of the, the sort of path-dependent impacts uh, of these early career choices uh, that, that you make. Um, and <clears throat> one of the things that uh, I used to tell people uh, when they asked me what is it that I did at the White House, um, one of my uh, only half facetious jokes was that my job was really HR uh, because the most important thing that I did was to recruit uh, really talented people uh, like the dean uh, who in, in Vijay's case was able to make really important contributions to the National Robotics Initiative and the initiatives in other areas like uh, cyber physical systems. Um, so I would both uh, take a chance on people that I thought were just really talented uh, and had an idea of something that they wanted to accomplish, or I would say, I want to do more in this particular area. How do I find the very best person who can help drive a science and technology initiative for President Obama in, in that area. So <clears throat> uh, OSTP uh, was, uh, had two major jobs. Uh, one was science and technology for policy. So if the president has to make a decision, like should we enter into this arms control treaty, uh, do we have the technical means necessary to, to verify compliance? Uh, what are the immediate risks opposed uh, uh, um, stemming from the Ebola outbreak or the Fukushima incident. So the president has to make a decision. We want to make sure that the president has the best possible scientific and technical advice in order to make that decision. So we call that science and technology for policy. Then there's policy for science and technology. So what investments should we be making in research and development? How do we encourage more young people to get excited about science, technology, engineering, and math? Uh, those types of questions. And uh, we had four major divisions. We had a science division uh, that, that worried about support for fundamental research, um, a national security and international affairs division uh, that uh, who, they were always profoundly depressed because they were working on issues like cybersecurity and countering weapons of mass destruction, so they were never in a good mood. Um, we had the uh, energy and environment division that was concerned about um, uh, climate change, adaptation, climate science, the health of the oceans, informing environmental policy on, on things like toxic chemicals, and then uh, my division, which was the technology and innovation division. So what I'm going to do, uh, as opposed to telling you what I did in my summer vacation, I'm going to tell you uh, what some of the things that my team and I uh, worked together on uh, over the, uh, the eight-year period. And one of the things that made this a lot of fun is that President Obama was really interested in science and technology. Um, his favorite meetings of the day were meeting with scientists and engineers, 
because unlike a lot of the other people that he had to interact with in Washington, uh, he found scientists and engineers to be uh, logical, uh, uh, interested in making decisions on the basis of evidence, uh, and not only identifying problems, but uh, saying, well, here's something that you could do about them. So he found scientists and engineers to be not optimistic in the sense of everything's going to be okay, but if we do have problems, then we think that, uh, that science and engineering and experimentation is one of the ways to solve them. So this was important for two reasons. One is he would bring us into his office and say, I want you to go work on this. Uh, so having a mandate from the president is really helpful in terms of being able to get things done. The other thing is that he was really open to ideas that we generated. Uh, so that dramatically increased the effectiveness of the Office of, of Science and Technology Policy and made it a really fun place to work, which is why I stayed there for, for eight years. And <clears throat> we had an overall framework for what we thought the role of the government was uh, in terms of promoting innovation. One was the importance of investing in the building blocks of long-term economic growth, job creation, and productivity. So this is things like research, uh, human capital, and infrastructure, both traditional infrastructure and 21st century infrastructure. The second was to create the right environment for private sector innovation, because if you're talking about new products and services, ultimately it's new and existing companies that, that create those. And then finally, what I used to call innovation for what? Uh, what is the connection between innovation and the big challenges that we face, whether it's allowing Americans to live longer, healthier lives, or accelerating the transition to a carbon neutral economy. Um, and what I'm gonna be talking about is some of the initiatives that fit into one of these categories. That is, we're investing in research in human capital, we're creating the right environment for private sector innovation, and we're trying to harness innovation to help solve a particular economic or societal challenge. The president was, uh, one of his top priorities was getting more young boys and girls excited about STEM education. And one of the first things he did as president was to say, if you win the Super Bowl or the NCAA, you get to come to the White House. The same thing should be tr true if you win a science fair or a robotics competition. Uh, and that's something that he continued uh, throughout his entire presidency. Um, it did make the rest of the White House staff feel like slackers uh, because we would routinely meet with these 16 year olds who were using functionalized gold nanoparticles to destroy cancerous tumors while leaving healthy cells untouched. And uh, I don't know about you, but at 16, I was playing Dungeons and Dragons as opposed to working on a cure for cancer. Um, uh, but th we used these events not only to uh, highlight the importance of STEM, but to uh, drive commitments. So we wanted the president to not only be able to say STEM is important, but here's what the government is doing, here's what companies are doing, here's what other stakeholders are doing to advance uh, STEM education. Um, and then uh, we also started something called the Maker Fair. This is Joey who developed, much to the, the delight of the Secret Service, a marshmallow cannon. Uh, he was specifically told not to fire the marshmallow cannon, but as soon as the president showed up and said, uh, you know, can, does this thing work? Uh, you know, he had carte blanche to show the president that it, in fact it did work. Um, he also started an initiative called Computer Science for All, which was about making computer science a new basic at the K through 12 level. Uh, not only learning about how to program, but uh, learning uh, computational thinking skills. Um, and one of the challenges of doing this in the United States <clears throat> is that there's no one person who can make a decision to do this. So unlike other countries that have a minister of education. So in Japan, there's one person, the minister of education, who can say, yes, uh, computer science is going to be part of a national curriculum. In the United States, we have 15,000 different school districts. Uh, so what we had to do, uh, and the uh, woman who, who worked on this for President Obama, Ruth Farmer, is continuing to do is, we have to build a mini social movement around this issue because we have to convince tens of thousands of individuals and organizations uh, that this is something that they should get behind. Um, we, uh, working with the National Academy of Engineering and uh, a number of the deans of engineering, 
uh, uh, expanded something called the Grand Challenge Scholars Program, uh, which was an idea that bubbled up from uh, a handful of universities, including Duke and Olin and, and USC. The idea is that undergraduates, uh, in addition to getting an engineering degree, could organize their coursework, research, service learning, uh, international activities and entrepreneurial activities around one of the 14 grand challenges uh, identified by the National Academy of Engineering. So this is one of the ideas that I'm interested in continuing to work on uh, for, for Schmidt Futures, which is that uh, at both the undergraduate and graduate level, one can imagine students uh, majoring in a discipline but minoring in a problem. So the pedagogical question that students and, uh, and universities and their external collaborators could ask is, what are all the curricular, co-curricular, and experiential learning opportunities that a student would need uh, to be able to make an important contribution to some problem at home or, or abroad? Um, and uh, so one university, as part of the long-range plan, has said, we want it to be the case that in the future, students will ask each other, not what's your major, but what's your mission? Uh, so how are you taking what you're learning uh, in a discipline like engineering uh, and, uh, and using it to solve an important problem at home or abroad? Um, the, another initiative that we launched in the area of STEM uh, was called 100K and 10. Uh, and this is one of the reasons that, that the initiative was successful is that we had a uh, a concrete goal if we'd said we want more STEM teachers at some point, unspecified point in the future, uh, it would have been less successful, but the fact that the president was able to articulate a goal uh, enabled us to make a lot of progress on this in terms of both increasing the number and qu quality of K through 12 teachers. Um, then we launched a series of uh, research initiatives. Here's one in, in, uh, in big data that was announced uh, in March of 2012. This was uh, an outgrowth of a report uh, that Professor Kearns was involved in, in writing, which was an analysis of the four and a half billion dollars that the government invested in uh, networking and information technology research and development, uh, and concluded that, that we were under investing in, uh, in data science and data intensive computing as opposed to high performance computing because the, this initiative had its outgrowth in concerns about US leadership in high performance computing beginning in the, in the 1980s and, and early 1990s. Um, as, uh, as Dean Kumar noted, um, I was involved in the development of the BRAIN initiative which President Obama announced in April of 2013. And the hypothesis behind this initiative is that neuroscience is limited by the tools that we currently have. So, for example, we can, take a, uh, we can measure the activity of a very small number of neurons with high levels of temporal and spatial resolution, or we can take a fuzzy picture of your entire brain, but we can't do anything in the middle. We can't uh, instrument real-time neural circuits and be able to measure their spiking activity at sub-millisecond time intervals. And so the idea is if we made a focused investment in tools, that would allow us to ask and answer new types of questions about how the brain encodes and processes information. It could lead to improvements in our ability to diagnose, treat, and prevent diseases of the brain, and could even inform the design of new algorithms and computing architectures uh, that are informed by how the brain works. Um, Launch the National Robotics Initiative um, that was motivated by uh, some work that the uh, Computing Community Consortium had done in terms of developing a roadmap, uh, particularly for human-robotic interaction, uh, an initiative that was uh, called the Materials Genome Initiative that was aimed at uh, reducing by 50% uh, the time required to discover uh, and develop new materials, which is currently 17 to, to 20 years. Um, and do we have any material scientists? Yes, all right. So I want everyone to remember that entire epochs of human civilization are named by what material we're using. So that's why we went from the stone to the bronze to the iron age to the silicon age. Um, and um, uh, the, you know, maybe the 21st century will be the age of computational material science and engineering. 
and we'll be able to start with the materials properties that we want and then be able to much more rapidly discover and synthesize it and make it scale the, those new materials. The reason I think this is so important is that a lot of the problems that we want to solve, like accelerating the transition to a carbon neutral economy, require innovations in materials. So if you think about you know, photovoltaics or energy storage or making lighter, stronger materials, that all ultimately rests on materials innovation. If it's taking us 17 to 20 years, uh, we don't have a lot of shots on goal between now and 2050, uh, which is when the United States and other advanced industrial countries would have need to have moved to uh, a carbon neutral economy. Um, we also not only thought about the what of innovation, but the how of innovation. Um, and so when I worked for uh, President Clinton, I was able to get DARPA uh, prize authority. They used it for a self-driving car competition. Uh, the first time they ran it, no one won. The second time, uh, Sebastian Thrun, uh, his, his team won. Uh, Larry Page of Google was at the finish line and he promptly acquired the winning team. Uh, so this is where the, uh, the Google self-driving car effort uh, came uh, from. And then when I came back into government, uh, I was able to get uh, every agency prize authority for up to $50 million. Um, and this was based on uh, something known as Bill Joy, uh, uh, Joy's Law, for Bill Joy, one of the early co-founders of Sun Microsystems, who said, no matter who you are, most of the smartest people work for someone else. Um, so if that's true, and I believe that it is true, um, then uh, organizations should be better at posing the problems that they want to solve and inviting uh, con contributions from, from people outside of their organization. Uh, and if you go to challenge.gov, you'll see over 800 instances uh, in which agencies have started to uh, use this authority. Um, we did a lot in the area of commercial space. Um, so one of the interesting things that NASA did when we retired the space shuttle, uh, uh, after that we had to start paying the Russians, uh, I think over $80 million per ticket per astronaut to, to go up to the International Space Station. Um, and so NASA entered into a, a partnership uh, with SpaceX and as opposed to their traditional contract where they would tell uh, you know, the company exactly what they wanted them to do, they said, we just want a rocket that will go up to the International Space Station, deliver and retrieve cargo, and ultimately astronauts. And if you can do that, we will provide you with a set of milestone payments. And they got for 400 million what they would have spent two to four billion using a more traditional uh, procurement process. So I hope one of the other things that you take away from this is that it's really interesting not only to, to study the, the what of innovation, uh, like robotics or data science, but the how of innovation and what are more efficient ways in which society can leverage science, technology, and innovation to help solve societal challenges. Uh, the, the, the innovation strategy um, was not only about investing in, in research, but also creating the right environment in the United States for innovation. And one of the things that we worked on was a rule that said, if you were uh, an entrepreneur and you wanted to come to the United States and create jobs, we should make that easier for you to do that. Um, we had tried to work with the Congress to pass legislation uh, for something called the startup visa, uh, but when that was not possible, we tried to, to find out whether there was some way that we can do, uh, do that through uh, regulation as opposed to law. And unfortunately, the current administration uh, is in the process of, of trying to overturn this. Um, we worked with Congress on something called the Jobs Act, uh, which made it easier for companies to raise capital and to go public and to enable not only the sort of donation-based uh, crowdfunding that you see on platforms like Kickstarter, but uh, equity-based crowdfunding. Um, something that, I, that my colleagues worked on uh, was something called the U.S. Digital Service. Um, and this happened because of uh, the failed launch of healthcare.gov. So what happened, at, so everyone knows that when healthcare.gov was released, it didn't, didn't work. Um, you know, it was uh, processing, you know, dozens of enrollments as opposed to millions of enrollments. 
So what happened is that um, we put out the bat signal uh, for help from some of the nation's top site reliability engineers and people in human-centered design and software engineering. Uh, they dropped everything else uh, that they were doing. They worked for 18 hours, on average, 18 hours uh, a day for, for three months. So they were starting to hallucinate a little bit towards the end of that. Uh, but they fixed the website uh, and in the process saved President Obama's uh, top domestic policy priority from a failed launch. Um, and after this episode, the president appropriately asked, why don't we have these people involved at the beginning and as opposed to waiting until there's a disaster? Uh, and so that is, uh, that is what led to the formation of the US Digital Service. And the first the person that we recruited to, to run this uh, is uh, a guy by the name of uh, Mikey Dickerson, who had this great job at Google uh, as a site reliability engineer. And he, g he gave a talk explaining why he came back into the government. So he describes l what it was like to leave the government after uh, launching, uh, helping to relaunch healthcare.gov. Health and he said, so I went back to my old job and tried to care about it. Uh, on one hand, the company does not need me. There are thousands of engineers that are as good or better. On the other hand, if I succeeded beyond anybody's wildest dreams, the net effect is that some extra billions of dollars would go to one billionaire instead of a different billionaire. It was hard to see why I should bother and still is. So we were actually able to bring him back in, in the government to lead the US Digital Service. And this is something that has um, successfully navigated the transition uh, from the Obama administration to uh, the current administration. Um, and there's a group of undergraduates uh, who has launched a project called Coding It Forward, uh, which is doing something similar uh, for undergraduate students in, in disciplines like CS and data science and design. So they're, they're spending their summers uh, working in the government trying to improve the delivery of, of government services. Um, the initiatives that we worked on were not just in the natural sciences and engineering. So I recruited a, a young woman who's in that uh, red dress, Maya Shankar. Uh, I decided to take a chance on her. She was, had been a child violin prodigy uh, with Itzhak Perlman, had won the major Yale undergraduate awards, uh, was a Rhodes Scholar, uh, and did a postdoc at Stanford in decision neuroscience. So I really went out on a limb uh, <laughs> and decided to give her a chance. And in short order, uh, she recruited 20 behavioral scientists to the federal government who are identifying all the different ways in which these behavioral insights uh, can improve uh, government policy and, and, and programs. And I think there's a really interesting opportunity for collaboration between computer scientists and uh, people in the, in the social and behavioral sciences. So um, in terms of the tools that we had in order to be able to get things done, here are five things, here are five plays that we would run. Uh, so one was that we were involved in the preparation of the president's budget. So if there was an idea that we were excited about that had bubbled up from the research community, like the Brain Initiative, then we can say, we want to provide additional funding in the budgets of the NIH or, or DARPA or the National Science Foundation or IARPA in order to be able to support that. So for things that required additional resources like research or investing in, uh, in education, uh, that was the first play that we ran, is uh, getting it into the president's budget, trying to provide additional resources for it. Second play was working with Congress and legislation. So for example, when I worked on getting uh, DARPA the ability to do incentive prizes and then ultimately all agencies, that required Congress to pass a law or uh, when uh, we wanted to make it easier for companies to raise capital and go public. That required working with Congress to change the law. The third is things that uh, agencies could do with the authority that they already had. Um, so the international entrepreneur rule, our first choice was pass a law, but when it became clear we weren't gonna be able to do that, we'd, we tried to say, is there something that the Citizenship and Immigration Service can do using the authority, the legal authority that they already have. 
The fourth was taking advantage of the president's ability to convene um, and, uh, and build coalitions. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that. Uh, and then finally, recruiting great people. So it's one thing to have an idea. Uh, as you know, though, ideas are not terribly useful unless you have the people that are excited about those ideas and can effectively implement them. Uh, so, so Maya is a, is a good example where I recruited her and she recruited another 20 behavioral scientists uh, to the federal government. So those were, you know, once we had an idea that we were, that we were excited about, those are some of the um, tools that we were able to use in order to get things done. Uh, and policy is about effectively creating a coherent relationship between ends and means. You have some goal that you're trying to achieve, and then you're trying to figure out uh, what are the steps that would be required to actually achieve that goal. So we had this very famous uh, whiteboard uh, where we would try to capture some of the aphorisms that we would, had learned about um, how to be effective um, because um, you know, our jobs were uh, what, an eight-year effort to answer the following essay question, which is, uh, you have a desk and a phone and a computer and a business card that says the White House on it. What do you do? Um, so in a sense, that these jobs were sort of very under-constrained, and so part of the job was to figure out what your job was. Uh, and so over time, we developed a, a set of uh, maxims or aphorisms that tried to capture some of the things that we learned. And I'm just going to talk about one of these because it's one of, one of my favorite. Um, and it's the following thought experiment, which is that you have 15 minutes with President Obama uh, in the Oval Office, uh, and uh, he says, um, if you give me a good idea, I will call anyone on the planet. Um, it can be a conference call, so there can be more than one person on the line. Uh, and if it's someone inside the government, uh, like the head of the National Science Foundation, then I can direct them to do something because I'm their boss. If it's someone outside the government, like the CEO of a company or the president of a research university or a philanthropic organization, then I can challenge them to do something. Um, and um, you have to tell me not only what your idea is and why you're excited about it, but in order to make your idea happen, who would I call and what would I ask them to do? Um, and there are three reasons three motivations for this thought experiment. And the first uh, relates to the Hamming question. Does anyone know what the Hamming question is? Anyone know what the Hamming question is? So Richard Hamming was a famous researcher at Bell Labs. And, he, and during, the, uh, during lunchtime, he would ask scientists, what, is the, what do you think is the most important uh, research question in your field? And, and then he'd have a conversation. And then he'd say, what are you working on? And the sort of the implied question was, why aren't you working on whatever you think the important research question is in your field? Uh, and so this is sort of like that question, like if you had 15 minutes with the president, like what idea would you pitch and why aren't you working on that? So that, that's like the first motivation. The second motivation for the question is that in any job that you have, you have some notion of what in your environment is fixed and what is potentially changeable. Uh, so, for example, you know that if you're a professor uh, and you have a great idea that you can write a research grant uh, with some probability it will be funded and then you can hire a bunch more grad students and postdocs and, and undergraduates. So, so that might be the, one of the ways in which you think about influencing the world. Well, we have the ability to send a decision memo to the leader of the free world and have him check the box that said yes. So what that does is it increases the sense of what you think is potentially changeable. Uh, it gives you uh, a sense for what psychologists call agency. Uh, and you realize over time that many of the things that other people might regard as fixed, uh, you regard as potentially changeable because they're the result of human action or inaction uh, as opposed to the laws of physics. And the third thing is that if you want to do something big and complex, uh, it is usually the case that you cannot do it by yourself. You need to build a coalition. Uh, and you can't build a coalition until you can articulate who are the members of the coalition, uh, what are the mutually reinforcing steps, 
uh, that I want them to take? How could I make it easier for them to say yes? Uh, are, are they going to, to what extent are they going to be willing and able? Uh, what constraints are they operating under that someone else might be able to relax? Um, and so I actually think that this is a useful thought experiment is, uh, is what would you do or what do you think should be done if you were not constrained by the resources that are currently under your control, where resources is not just a code word for money, although it may involve money, but it, it, it may also involve building a coalition of individuals and organizations that are in a unique position to help you advance your idea. Um, and this is something that I'm continuing to look, look for in uh, my role serving as the chief innovation officer for, for Schmidt Futures. So if you're interested in learning more about policy entrepreneurship, this is a uh, freely available uh, publication. Uh, you just Google uh, policy entrepreneurship and Khalil and it, and it should pop up. Um, but this is my effort to say, what are sort of the, uh, what was the learning by doing that I did by virtue of, of having worked for two presidents about how you go from an idea to something happening in the world like uh, the Brain Initiative that now has over $600 million a year in funding and, and lots of research teams uh, ar around the United States uh, w working on this effort. And I want to wrap up and then I'm eager, eager to uh, not only answer any of your questions, but to get some high quality free advice uh, from the people in the room um, of uh, talking about, you know, one of the things that Dean Kumar uh, always says, which is, that this is you know, a great time to be an engineer. Um, and it certainly is, you know, if you think about the opportunities in, in bioengineering where the cost of a genome has gone from $100 million to under 1,000, uh, our ability to, to literally put atoms where we want them to. So in the Singh Center, um, you know, people are making two-dimensional materials that are just sheets of carbon atoms and then uh, able to selectively uh, make a hole uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, an angstrom in, in diameter by, by selectively, uh, you know, uh, creating a defect and that might be able to use for water filtration. Or the fact that we now have access to uh, uh, computer chips like FPGAs that have 30 billion transistors on them. Um, but uh, I think as, uh, as Dean Kumar has also noted is that uh, as, uh, as has been noted in the 1962 issue of Spider-Man, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, and I think it's incumbent on engineers uh, to think about a number of different dimensions of, of what this responsibility uh, might be. And I'll, I'll give you three examples. So one is that there's no shortage of really important problems uh, to work on. So let me give you one. The United States is now 43rd in the world in terms of life expectancy. Uh, and life expectancy in the United States is going down rather than up. So even though we have amazing facilities like the you know, proton beams at the, uh, at the academic medical center right down the road, uh, and we're spending roughly twice as much as, a, as the share of our economy as other advanced industrial countries, we're getting worse health outcomes. So that's an example of something that I think engineering can make a contribution to. Um, the second is that we need to address some of the limitations of today's technology. So I'm sure everyone in computer science, for example, uh, would agree that we have lots of unsolved problems in areas like security and reliability. And the dean has been talking about the importance of, of fate, of uh, fairness, accountability, transparency, and, and ethics. And then finally, uh, I hope that uh, at least some of you will consider some type of public service at some point in your career. Uh, so what we did with the U.S. Digital Service is not tell people that you had to join the government and work there for 30 years, but that you could consider a tour of duty in the government in the same way that lawyers might say, well, I'm going to clerk for the Supreme Court or, or some judge, uh, or the, the way a a doctor might say, well, I'm going to you know, go work for the you know, U.S. Surgeon General. doesn't mean that they're going to do it their entire life, but it's something that they think about doing uh, over the arc of their entire uh, professional career. Um, so that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. 
And uh, I'm ha happy to answer any questions uh, that you have, uh, or as I said, get some high quality free advice from the uh, people in the room. Thank you. Yeah. So I think one is just through storytelling, right? So for example, if you take your cell phone and you say, where did GPS come from? Uh, where did the advanced semiconductor design for the FinFUT come from? Where did the GMR come from for the, uh, for the storage? Where did the internet come from? Where did the first graphical web browser come from? Uh, so I think that one is just sort of a basic level of awareness. People don't know that even though uh, ultimately, it was the private sector that turned it into a commercial product or service. And they may have spent 100 times more than the government, but that the government played this really important role in terms of uh, supporting fundamental science and engineering and demonstrating that something that we might have previously thought was impossible is, is now possible. So, you know, if you go back to the 1960s and 70s when DARPA began investing in packet switch networks, AT&T thought they were crazy. They were like, that is a waste of money. Why would you do that, right? So, um, so I think the problem is, is that there can often be this long lag between when the government invests in something uh, and when it leads to some commercial product and service. So people may think, oh, speech recognition, that's something that Apple did, not realizing that, like, yes, they, Apple invested too, but there was sort of, sort of this preceding 30 years to get speech recognition to the point where it was usable, uh, that was the result of sustained uh, government investment. So, so it's a great question. I don't have a good answer to it, but I think part of it is, is storytelling of, of increasing people's awareness uh, about the government role. Yes? Um, I, I grew up around NASA Goddard. Yep. Right around 2009 or sometime when this manned space flight program was being ended, there was a lot of sort of like um, discomfort with the, the, with the administration's decision. Uh, I think it seems like it's paid off now with all of the private sector investment in space. I kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on like how that decision came about, how you sure. go back. Yeah, so it wasn't that we were gonna end the manned space program. It was that number one, we were retiring the space shuttle uh, because uh, we could no longer guarantee its safety. And the second is that the uh, the previous administration said, let's go back to the moon. And our view was, we've already been to the moon, right? So like, why, why would we go back, did, did something that we did in the 1960s using essentially the same technology? Um, so it wasn't that we, we said, let's end the manned space program. It's like, let's do something different, um, number one. And number two, if you go back uh, and look at the organization that came before NASA was called NACA. And it viewed its role as creating the aerospace industry, which it did successfully. Uh, and so we we're like, hey, we think there's a similar opportunity now. And so that's why uh, uh, NASA partnered with companies like SpaceX to create these new capabilities. And now the United States has gone from being essentially nowhere in the commercial uh, launch market to really being one of the, the dominant players. Yep. Sure. Yeah. 
So one thing that I really strongly believe in is that if you look at the government's portfolio of trying to advance science, technology, and innovation, uh, the dominant way in which we do that is through grants and contracts. So uh, economists call that a push approach, which is I give you some money and I hope that you will deliver what was in your, in your statement of work. Uh, and I think that that is a really important way for, for the government uh, to advance. But it's not the only way. Uh, and I think that, that our portfolio is, is underweight on what economists call pull approaches. That is, the government identifies an innovation that it wants to see. Uh, so for example, in the case of NASA, it was we want a rocket that can go up to the International Space Station and deliver and retrieve cargo. And then we're going to provide you with a financial incentive to go solve that problem for us. And we're going to be agnostic about which team and approach is most likely to be successful. Um, so uh, uh, the global health community has, has d done a good job of this because left to their own devices, drug companies will not work on vaccines for poor people because they have no money. So they can't go to their shareholders and say, we want to work for a vaccine that will, is primarily dedicated to people that are living on $2 a day. And an economist uh, by the name of Michael Kramer came up with a really clever approach to solving this problem, which is a purchase order for a product that doesn't exist yet. So as a result of this work, five countries in the Gates Foundation went to two pharma companies and said, if you develop a vaccine which is safe and effective, then we will buy it. And so the government said, we will bear the demand risk if you bear the performance risk. And I think that approach is, uh, if it's well designed, can be very useful. It is not a, it's not a substitute for supporting fundamental research uh, through grants. You know, research uh, faculty members are not going to be able to raise money on the, on the prospect that if they solve a problem that they'll, they'll get money at some point in the future, right? So it's, it's not like that is an, an answer to all of our innovation problems. But it is something that I believe that we're underutilizing relative to its efficacy. Uh, great talk. Uh, one more to touch upon again on the idea of storytelling that was uh, raised on the first question, uh, which is uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, great programs are funded by the government. Uh, there's great initiative, and technology initiative. I was wondering that in this political climate where you want to really have a strong narrative and storytelling, is there a way or is there any office or agency in the government that goes on or can potentially quantify how much, how much dollar goes in and what uh, uh, macroeconomic uh, indicators does it impact API or GDP or what have you? And is there a way to sort of close that loop uh, to make a better narrative? Yeah. So um, it, it's very difficult to do that at a macro level. Uh, but there have been some efforts to take particular projects, and the Human Genome Project is a good example. People have tried to say, what was the economic value of supporting the Human Genome Project? Um, similarly, there's a part of the National Academy of Sciences called the Computer Science and Telecommunications Board that has said, of the sort of billion dollar plus uh, industry segments within IT, how many of them have their roots uh, in government-supported research. And the problem is the public doesn't read National Academy reports. Uh, so having that sort, sort of analysis is necessary but not sufficient. Uh, you, you also need people who are good at, uh, you know, getting a, getting a message out to the, to the broader public. Uh, ATS and the USDS are obviously very successful at what they do, but they mainly focus on digital infrastructure. Yes. Where is there room for similar, like, crack teams Yeah. So the question would be, to what extent do they need to come into the government, right? So um, generally, we want those teams, but we're happy to have them stay in the university. With the digital services, the view was you needed at least some of these people in the government to demonstrate that it was possible to make really rapid progress and to even be able to know what to ask for. Um, so. It would depend on the nature of the problem about whether or not you actually need to, to bring in the top material scientists into the government or whether they can do their work at a national lab or in a company or in a university or some sort of consortium. I wonder if I can ask you about your 
new role, sure. and what the Schmidt features does, and, and, and also more generally how you transitioned from your role at the White House into, into this uh, cyber philanthropic organization. Yeah, so it's a, uh, Schmidt Futures is an organization that was created by Eric and Wendy Schmidt about a year ago. Um, a lot of what we do is uh, providing grants to research universities and nonprofit organizations, but we also have the ability to invest in commercial firms, but through an impact lens as opposed to a financial uh, return lens. Um, and uh, so far, you know, we're a new organization, but we have three broad programmatic areas. Um, one is looking at the role that technology can play in accelerating the pace of scientific research. Um, so uh, an example of a project that I recommended that, that Eric is funding is using machine learning to accelerate the search for uh, new materials. Um, so uh, that's one program. The second is asking a similar set of questions, but with respect to societal challenges. Um, so we're supporting a, a project here at Penn uh, in a research group called Behavior Change for Good that is trying to integrate behavioral science and, and computer science, particularly for those behavior changes that need to persist over a long time like medical adherence uh, or going to the gym. Uh, and the third problem that we're looking at is shared prosperity, uh, which is, uh, for example, the large gulf that has opened up in terms of the incomes and labor force participation between college and non-college educated workers. Um, so those are, those are three broad areas, and then within those we have particular programs. So for example, on the uh, leveraging technology to solve societal challenges. Um, we're it, looking at a, an area that some people have called data collaboratives. And what, what is meant by data collaboratives is that you have a collaboration going on between an organization that has the data, a team that can derive insights from the data using data science and machine learning, and then individuals and organizations that can take some action or make some higher quality decision based on those insights. So, uh, an example is that uh, internet companies, because they wanted to figure out which broadband technology should they deploy in a given geography, paid for high resolution satellite imagery, ran it through a convolutional neural network. They now have better population density maps than the WHO has. Uh, so how do we make those maps available so that they're not only used to inform broadband decisions, but uh, help with the vaccination of uh, low-income children in sub-Saharan Africa. So how do we go from data to knowledge to action? Uh, by having collaborations between people who have the data, derive insights from it, and then take some action on the basis of those insights. And what we're finding to be sort of the binding constraint is uh, more individuals and teams who are bilingual. That is, uh, they, un they understand these tools and what their strengths and limitations are, but they also understand enough about a particular problem so that they can help find and define a problem that's worth solving in a particular domain. So you've got to produce some more of those, Dean Kumar. <laughs> so one of the things I didn't mention um, among Tom's many accomplishments is two months ago, he recently became a Penn engineering parent. <laughs> yes. That's the real accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> so let's thank Tom Kalil.